Hi, this is Alan McCagland, Associate Professor of History at Campbell University, a former merchant mariner and an adjunct professor in maritime industry policy. So I wanted to continue our Memorial Day salute to the Merchant Marine. This is part two of the series. Part one was on the Military Sealift Command today in 2021. Part two is going to look at the U.S. Merchant Marine uh, during three conflicts where they lost mariners. That is World War I, World War II, and the Vietnam War. Uh, this image you see here, this is the monument to merchant mariners down at the Battery in New York City of three merchant mariners afloat on a raft with one of them reaching down trying to grab one of their fallen shipmates. And I think this is a very symbolic, very powerful monument, and I think a very important one to remember the services of merchant mariners on Memorial Day. So I had hoped to have this episode out on Memorial Day. I know I'm a day late and I apologize for that. But the reason the episode did not get done was, was twofold. One, I was filming a different episode for some events that happened that I wanted to get out there. But second, I, this happened. And, and I have to say, this, this happens a lot when it comes to dealing with the Merch Marine. So first off this, this is a post uh, tweet uh, done by the Cato Institute, their Cato Trade Division, uh, talking about the Jones Act. Uh, the Jones Act is the Merchant Marine Act of 1920, and they have a systematic campaign of attacking the Jones Act. The, the Cato has been doing it. They have someone who's hired full time to do nothing but write about the Jones Act and repealing it. He's not a lobbyist, as he keeps telling me this. But again, someone who's paid full time to do nothing but advocate a certain position toward members of Congress sounds like a lobbyist to me. But regardless of that, they decided to post this on Memorial Day. An incomplete, misleading, or simply false talking points that help sustain the Jones Act for more than 100 years. And they talk about the Jones Act that it ensured domestic supply, uh, shipbuilding capacity, they cross that out, ensured a ready supply of vessels in times of war emergency, they cross that out. I think everyone is completely entitled to their opinion, their viewpoints that they want to articulate. I have no problem with that. I do have a problem when they attack the Jones Act on Memorial Day, when we should be commemorating and remembering those who had fallen in the service of the United States, including merchant mariners, particularly those who were in the Jones Act trade, who gave their lives for the United States. And not going to lie, got me a little bit going uh, when I, I read this tweet. The other element was this story I posted. This was a story that comes out almost yearly, uh, talks about the Merchant Marine suffered the worst losses of World War II. I didn't write this story. This is on We We Are the Mighty. Logan Nye wrote this, published in April of uh, 2020. Popped up my feed. I retweeted it out. And one of the things that it talks about is the fact that Merchant Mariners suffered a higher percentage, you know, per capita Merchant Mariners suffered a higher loss than any other service. Now, I will tell you, actually, I'm not a big, fan of that statistic in many ways, because I think it leaves out some key numbers. It leaves out the shipyard workers. It leaves out the numbers of people in the ship companies at home. Uh, I think it just looks at the merchant mariners. But one of the things it does highlight is the absolute dangerous nature that it was for merchant mariners in World War II. And Logan does a good job. He has in here all the statistics you'd want, all the details that are in here. I'll have, of course, a link to this so you can read uh, the full story. But again, one of the big things that are in here, the growth of the Merchant Marine during uh, World War II, thanks to shipbuilding, which was absolutely essential. Loss of lives. This is from World War I, showing the Lusitania being sunk, even though it's not an American ship. But one of the things that I think it does, it really highlights the fact that civilians kind of risk their lives in this field for the United States. And again, I, I reposted this story literally just just cut and paste it, post it on my Twitter feed. And, and almost immediately, you get some responses uh, back from it. I got some great responses back from some people. Hey, you know, chief engineer I met was torpedoed. My father was part of the armed guard on PQ-17. My hat's off to him. Spent 33 uh, months at, at Milag Nord, which was a uh, prisoner of war camp. Absolutely just, just, just fantastic. But then you get these other replies. And again, I don't mean to bash, but again, you know, Merchant Marine definitely had high losses, but the worst, not even close. Casualties suffered by the 8th Air Force. Hey, there's no questioning that. There's no questioning the 8th Air Force. If we just look at one element, yes, the 8th Air Force suffered more than a higher percentage, but the 8th Air Force was part of a larger entity, the, the Army Air Forces, and it was part of a larger entity, the Army. And what was those percentage of casualties? And then he adds this, the U-boats fared worse, lost over 75%. I, I hope he realizes that the U-boats were trying to sink the Merchant Marine. They really, I, you know, I really don't care that their losses were high. I wish they were 100%. 
at time. So, you know, I went back and I gave him the numbers. And I also highlighted the fact that when merchant mariners were sunk on their vessels, they were on their own. And I mean that literally, they stopped getting paid at that moment. They stopped being covered by their companies. They basically went for a swim in the Atlantic and Pacific on their own dime. And when they spent captivity in a German or Japanese prisoner of war camp, they weren't getting paid. And then on top of that, they are not considered veterans until 1988. But the comment that got me of everything was this one here by Salty SSN 637. So obviously a sturgeon man. You're a history professor, just checking. I always love when people ask me that, because again, the, the connotation here is that I am some sort of, I don't know, liberal left-wing nut job who, who just doesn't check facts. I do check facts and I check statements all the time. And I gave him that and I showed him my sources. So I am fine for comments, don't get me wrong. I, I enjoy comments. Uh, if you follow me on Twitter, at McCogliano I'm happy to, to have these kind of conversations. But that kind of comment right there, just really, especially on, on, on dealing with an issue like merchant mariners who gave their lives, civilians who gave their lives in service of the United States. So with that in mind, I want to talk about that. I want to talk about first World War I, then World War II, and then the Vietnam War. So let's talk about World War I. So first off, one of the places that can provide you one of the best overall informations on this is actually at AmericanHistory.si.edu, and if you the SI doesn't catch you, that's the Smithsonian Institute. Uh, they have an entire series, on, the On the Water series, that looks at America and its maritime heritage. And one of those sections, section six, is entitled "Answering the Call," and it covers the period from World War One, 1917, until 1945. It has here sections on building ships for victory. So if you're interested in in that aspect the building ships for victory. You can go through here, some great information. I think it was just fantastic. Again, this is Smithsonian Institute. They don't do anything really, you know, on the cheap here. So they definitely provide a, a great resource here. Posters, imagery, uh, uh, material culture, you name it. Just, just absolutely fantastic material going through both World War I, World War II, imagery here, building vessels, models of vessels, graphs and charts showing the ships that are under construction. Just a, a absolutely fantastic resource here. And then the, the next one here is their merchant seamen, which I like a lot too, because it gives you the personal aspect. So they got posters. I got this poster right up here on my wall right here. You bet I'm going back to see. I always love that poster. It's one of my favorite posters of all times. But one of my favorite things that they have in here is they talk about the perils of the sea, but then they have in their own words. So here are merchant mariners testimonies talking about what it, what it, they did, everything from engine room training, navigating in the dark, drills, uh, come down here, the brutality of their captors, torpedo attack. Uh, you can hear it in their own words, a, a great resource for you to listen to. And these are World War II veterans talking about it. Absolutely great. But let's talk about World War I. So one of the sites I recommend in full heartedly, if you want to get some research on the American Merchant Marine, is this site right here www.usmm.org, the American Merchant Marine at War. Great site, you'll see some of my stuff on here. Fantastic site, has resources, information, everything you want on here. I reference this a lot. So one of the things they have on here is a site on Merchant Marine in World War I. And one of the things about this site that I like is they have this list of casualties right here. Comparison of Navy and Merchant Marine World War I casualties. Unknown to most people, the Merchant Marine suffered greatly in World War I. We tend to focus on World War II because it's got Nazis and, and submarines and panzers. But World War I, we saw American ships suffer greatly. Matter of fact, as we'll talk about, the reason we get into World War I is because of American merchant ships. Here you see the number of Navy ships sunk, 98. The number of Navy killed, 1,323. However, there are more merchant ships sunk, 197, 629 killed, including 20 merchant mariners who are POWs. One of the things the Germans like to do is grab masters uh, out of the, the vessels they sunk. Uh, they started really picking the masters out, trying to get rid of that experience, and they would sail them back to Germany. So right here, you see that imagery right here, and it breaks it down by how they were sunk, by torpedo or bomb, mine, uh, mine barrage, miscellaneous, fire explosion, collision. And if you want to get into more detail uh, about how that was done, you can actually, let's see, I think I had it on here somewhere. Let me find what I did with it. I know I had it on here. Hang on a second. Let me pull it up for you. Sorry, I had it right here for you. 
Apologies, a little disorganized, but here you go. This is the link to those American ship casualties in World War uh, One, and it breaks all those vessels down. You can find the individual vessels in here by categories. So U.S. naval ships sunk or damaged by enemy torpedo bom bombs or gunfire. This is where that list is derived from. And then you can come down here and see every vessel that was lost or sunk, whether a U.S. naval vessel or American merchant ships, for example. You can see how they're broken up. And if you go through here and you look at the World War I site here, they, they have information here on shipbuilding, on training, on all aspects about this. So there's a lot about this. And one of the things that's not commonly realized is how many vessels were built during World War I. Uh, we know about Henry J. Kaiser and the massive shipbuilding during World War II, but in truth, World War I saw massive shipbuilding on a scale only rivaled by World War II. The issue with World War I is it got started late. We didn't pass the Shipping Act until 1916 and really didn't start building ships in large numbers until 1917. Uh, I wrote uh, an article on this, which I'll have a link to. Uh, it's available through the um, uh, Canadian uh, uh, Nautical Research Society, their Northern Mariner publication, which is great. It's available for everybody. They can read past articles in it. I did an article on the Shipping Act of 1916. So I'll have that on there. So it talks about the shipbuilding program, what was built, how many vessels, the type of vessels, uh, steel vessels, wooden vessels, uh, uh, concrete vessels, composite vessels, you name it, all in there. And one of the things that I think gets missing about World War I, go back to the comments at the very beginning here, uh, particularly the Jones Act comments, is you know, how do we get into World War I? And one of the ways we get into it is, is the fact that the US merchant ships are directly attacked by German submarines. In February of 1917, this is the second unrestricted submarine warfare. First one sank the Lusitania, a British ship back in 1915, but the second one brings the United States into the war. And if you read Wilson's statement to Congress on April 2nd, 1917, where he lays out the conditions for war, a the last true time we've ever really debated and, and, and really had this debate about war, is 1917, the World War II ones really weren't debated. They were almost unanimous. There was almost no debate on them because of the J Japanese attack and the German de declaration of war. But here we debated it. And what he says in that statement is, it's not the Zimmerman telegram, it's not inciting Mexico. It is the sinking of US ships. And Rodney Carlisle writes a great book on this entitled Sovereignty at Sea, US Merchant Ships and American Entry into World War I. This is the University Press of Florida site. Uh, the book's a little pricey on the hardcover side. Uh, you can get the paperback for 25 bucks. You can probably find it on Amazon a lot cheaper. But a great book. It really breaks down the attack on the U.S. ships. And one of the things that the reason U.S. ships are being targeted in 1917 is because they're sailing into the war zone. Why are they sailing into the war zone? Because back in 1914, when the U.S. relied on foreign ships for most of its international trade, those ships disappeared. The German ships went into the harbors and basically were in interned. And the British ships were diverted over to wartime use. And so American exports and imports piled up on the dock, very similar to what we're seeing on the West Coast of the United States today. And what carried US export and import? There were the ships in the coastal trade. For example, this vessel right here, the SS Vigilancia. Uh, Vigilancia was a vessel that was built specifically for trade down to Cuba. Uh, it was used in the coastal trade, actually uh, did uh, trade along the U.S. East and Gulf Coast and to Cuba. Uh, she was used during the Spanish-American War. There's actually a picture of her right here uh, being used during the Spanish-American War as a, oh, that didn't magnify, sorry, but uh, being used as a, as a troop transport, actually carried a, a, a part of the uh, expedition down to Santiago. But in World War I, it was being used to carry exports overseas. Uh, it was being carried exports, and it was in the war zone after February 1st when it was torpedoed and sunk and part of the crew died on board. And because we had ships in the coastal trade, we had a big, huge, robust coastal trade, we were able to shift some of those vessels into the international trade to replace the German and British ships that we'd lost. Eventually, 10 vessels are lost. 64 crew members killed, 24 of which are American. And that's one of the primary reasons that Wilson gives for the declaration of war. And American merchant mariners bear the brunt of this. 
when the U.S. decides to start sending forces over to France, almost immediately, there's a decision to send a token force over. They put together what's called the first expeditionary division, what becomes the first U.S. division. We send that unit over. We have to get together transports to carry them over. Where do those transports come from? The U.S. merchant fleet. Uh, again, I wrote about this in a piece for Sea History Magazine, the National Maritime Historical Society is a great resource for news and information uh, and history. Uh, I wrote this piece on them about the creation of something called the Cruiser Transport Force. But one of the things we did for those first convoys, and this is a piece that's written over the Navy History and Heritage Command. Again, I'll have all these in the show notes for you to look at. It talks about that first convoy going across, that first group of ships that carried over the 14,000 soldiers of the American Expeditionary Force of the 1st Expeditionary Division, along with the 5th Marine Regiment, going across. And when you look at the makeup of this, this is from a, a book entitled The History of Transport Service, written by Albert Gleaves, who was the commander of the Cruiser and Transport Force. He lays out these transports. And in June of 1917, we basically pull 14 vessels out of the commercial trade. Saratoga and Havana, for example, are ships that are in the New York and Cuba mail uh, steamship uh, company. They work down the East Coast, Gulf Coast of the United States, and they go to Cuba. And Saratoga and, and Havana are part of that initial. Matter of fact, later on, when they come back, they're going to be converted into the hospital ships Comfort and Mercy. Uh, Tendoras and uh, Pastores, they're part of uh, basically the United Fruit Company. They're basically banana boats running down to the Caribbean, but they also carry passengers. And the rest of these vessels, Mamas, Antilles, Lenop, uh, uh, Mallory, are all coastal vessels used within the cabotage trade. This is before the Jones Act, but they're still in the, in, in the cabotage trade. Finland is one of the only ones that's involved in transatlantic passengers. Uh, the cargo ships, the Montana and Dakotan, they're from American Hawaiian lines. They sail between the east and west coast of the United States. Initially, they just used the Panama Isthmus, but now they're using the Panama Canal. And again, out of the 14 vessels that are used here, 11 of them, 11 of them are basically in the dedicated cabotage coastal trade. Uh, some of them, again, are in the, are, are in the, the basically the, the fruit trade going back and forth, just, just carrying basically banana boats, but they also carry passengers. And then there's the Finland going across. And even within the escorts here, there are two yachts that are brought up, the Aphrodite, over here in, in, in this first one, you see the Aphrodite brought over here. And then the other one is, uh, where is she at here? There is another yacht you see in the first one. Yep, the Corsair, which is JP Morgan's yacht. Uh, they're, they're bought and they're, they're outfitted for commercial service. Even the supply vessels, the Arm Collier Cyclops and the Arm Collier Kanawa, prior to May of 1917, they had civilian crews on board. And matter of fact, their commanders, Werner and Worley, were licensed merchant mariners. They were just given reserve commissions and brought in. So World War I is a textbook example of why you need a robust merchant marine to support the military in time of war. So let's go over to World War II. Now, World War II is perhaps the best demonstration you have of that. And again, this is the uh, USMM.org site that has the merchant marine in World War II with a lot of details. In here again, if you really want to do, you know, some research and some great stories in here, their their site on World War II is absolutely fantastic. Ship sinkings, details, convoy stories, sub stories are, are in here throughout the the whole thing. The Murmansk Run, uh, action in the South Atlantic, talking about uh, midshipman Edwin J. O'Hara, one of the midshipmen from uh, Kings Point, the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy. 142 cadets were killed during. World War II, the only service academy to lose its members during war is the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy because they go out on ships at sea. They didn't do that with the Navy Academy. They didn't do that with the uh, West Point. Uh, talk about the Merchant Marine in the Pacific. Just, a, just a, a slew of details in here. I can't tell you how much to go in here and take a look at this. Uh, talk about that Merchant Marine casualties. This is that percentage we were talking about here, one in 26 if you're a merchant mariner, 134 if you're a Marine, one in 48 if you're the Army, one in 114 if you're Navy. That doesn't minimize, let me be clear, the, the dangers that the armed services fought at. That's not what it's meant to do. It's meant to highlight how dangerous it was for these civilians to do this. Again, the number is, is, is I would argue too, this number is not really clear, by the way. 
Uh, we don't know how many actually served, uh, anywhere between 215 to 285,000. Even the number of dead varies depending on the sources you go at. Again, you know, one of the things you see here is different numbers, 5.6 thousand, 6.8 thousand, 8.4 thousand, 9.5 thousand, nobody knows for sure. That's one of the saddest issues about here is we just don't know the statistics on how many merchant mariners died in, in World War II. And again, this breaks down the numbers of merchant mariners uh, killed and everything, including the number of ships, including the number of ships that were sunk or, 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 or damaged before Pearl Harbor even started. Uh, one of the, the guises that was done during the lead up to World War II, I should mention, was reflagging vessels to the Panamanian flag to get around neutrality acts, but they kept their American crews on board. So a lot of American crews died on Panamanian flagged vessels. Uh, and, and so we see that as one of the problems we're going on here. Uh, number of ships that just vanished, just absolutely vanished with, with, with no, you know, uh, no details whatsoever. Entire crews were, 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 were gone off them. You know, one of the very first vessels, the Cynthia Olsen, which is sunk uh, on, on the day of Pearl Harbor uh, by the I-26, uh, we see that happen. The two vessels that were at, uh, uh, at um, um, the uh, Port Chicago on the West Coast that blew up in which the focus has always been on and should be on the African-American plight of workers in the U.S. Navy, but those two ships vaporized and the crews on board them were gone. Unfortunately, the fact is that there's not a lot written about the Merchant Marine in World War II. One of the best sources to see how important shipping is in World War II, I would argue, is the Army. The Army does a massive series on World War II, uh, what's referred to as the Green Book series, and they have two volumes on global logistics and strategy. One's 1940 to 43, the other one's 43 to 45. But in there, I, I mean, shipping is everywhere in here. It's just, it, it's really amazing how important shipping is to this. If you just do a, a search for shipping here, I just did a quick little search for the term shipping in this, and you'll see it doing the search right here. It comes up 947 times in an army book. In an army book on World War II, 947 times they mentioned shipping. So it gives you an idea how important it is. Uh, the Navy does not spend as much time talking about this. If you go look at the 15 volume Morrison series on World War II, unfortunately Morrison is very critical of the Merchant Marine, actually derogatory at times against the Merchant Marine. And even when you read something like Duncan Ballantyne's book on naval logistics in the Second World War, they leave out the role the Merchant Marine largely plays. And, and I would say this about the book too, it's really a boring book to read. It's just, I love this stuff, but man, it's, it's, it's a dry read. Uh, they don't make it exciting at all. But that's not saying there isn't information out there. Unfortunately, what the Merchant Marine got out of World War II for history was this, the United States Merchant Marine at war. You'll see right there, 85 pages, 85 pages. The Army got 81 volumes. The Merchant Marine gets 85 pages. And it's one of the reasons why I think that the Merchant Marine doesn't get the attention it deserves. This came out right at the end of the war. It talks about the winning combination, the cargo lift, the wartime fleet, the men who sailed the ships, the administrative machinery, the present and the future. And it goes in, but it's, it's not a lot of details. I actually pulled this off the... Marad website, and I'll give you the link to this, but you'll see this is a, you know, a Xerox copy of a copy. So it's not even that great of a copy that's, that's out there. And this again is like the only official history of the Merchant Marine during World War II. And unfortunately, I would argue it's incomplete, doesn't have a lot of information in it. There's really no real true personal stories about it. And unless you know what they're talking about, it's kind of hard to follow in many ways. Uh, if you really want some good books, there are some good books coming out on this. You know, one of my favorites is, is William Garrow's The Matthews Men, Seven Brothers and the War Against Hitler's U-Boat. The problem with the Merchant Marine in World War II, I'll tell you, is there's a lot of stories and books like this that give you the micro history, but there's a few books that give you the macro history. Yes, there were previous books, uh, The Long Haul and, 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 and uh, uh, Stephen Bunker's book, uh, but, but they don't do a good, what I would argue, synthesizing the role of the Merchant Marine into the overall narrative of World War II. The other element about World War II that really is, should get more attention is, of course, the shipbuilding aspect. If you go to the Marad site, they actually have a, a discussion about that with the shipbuilding program of the U.S. Maritime Commission, 
Uh, they talk about the different vessels that were built and some details on that. But ironically, one of the best sites out there is the National Park Service. The National Park Service, who has, as part of their National Park Program, uh, sites uh, where ships were built. So, for example, up in South Port Portland, up in Maine, one of the areas where there was a shipbuilding site is as part of the National Park Service. And so they have this about Liberty ships and Victory ships, a great resource. I mean, just really well, well done. Uh, I'm not sure who did this for the National Park Service, but absolutely just a, a great resource here to look at. And again, I will, of course, have this in, in the show notes for you to take a look at here. Does a great job, looks at all this information, has all these details out there, talks about the building of, of, of vessels today. Unfortunately, you'll see there the U.S. in 1942, one symbol equals pre, uh, pre-war fleet, 6.8 million deadweight tons. Right now, the U.S. fleet's 8.3 million tons. Current, right now, 8.3. So we're not much bigger than we were in 1942. And to give you an idea here, we build about two and a half of those in between 1943 and 44. The Chinese are building that same amount in the first quarter of 2021. Uh, the, the entire Chinese uh, uh, Costco, the Chinese overseas shipping company, the largest commercial shipping company in the world has 111 million deadweight tons of shipping, four times the height of the US Merchant Marine at the end of World War II. So it gives you some uh, perspective there. But absolutely fantastic site to look at here on, uh, on shipbuilding and the Merchant Marine in World War II. So one of the comments again by the Cato Institute was the you know the fact that the Jones Act doesn't contribute again to war. Well, here's a good example of it right here. This is Admiral Edmund J. Morgan uh, Moran, excuse me, Admiral Edmund J. Moran. Moran was for, of Moran tugs and towing boats. Uh, if you've been anywhere up and down the United States coast, you'll seen a Moran towboat, red with a black funnel with a big white M on that. Well, Edmund Moran had sailed for the Navy during World War I, and during World War II, he was brought back into the Navy. And one of the figures, one of the things he did was uh, organize tugboats up and down the East Coast of the United States when German U-boats came over during Operation Packenschloss, Operation Drumbeat, and started sinking American coastal vessels, again, Jones Act trade vessels. Uh, Edmund Morgan organized tugs to go out and salvage those vessels and bring them back into port. His role was probably the most important when it came to the D-Day operation. Uh, elevated up to a rear admiral, he oversaw the tugboat operation to, uh, to create what was referred to as the mulberries, the artificial ports off Omaha and Gold Beach. Uh, he brought together this fleet of tugboats, uh, including government-built tugs, commercial chartered tugs, you name it. He brought tugboat crews into the military service to bring these, these uh, expertise in and help establish the mulberries off the port. And it was Moran that was absolutely essential in doing that, including civilian tugs. There were civilian tugboats involved in this, warshipping administration tugboats with civilian crews on board. Again, built along the coast of the United States, all within Jones Act capabilities. And again, this is the exact issue we're talking about, bring together that expertise into the service. That's what you build upon. And that was what was necessary for victory in World War II. And this brings me to the Vietnam War. Now you may sit there and say, well, why, why bring the Vietnam War? That's not a peer-to-peer -peer conflict. It's not a world war. It's a, it's, it's a small war. It's, 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 a, it, it's not on the scale. Now, granted, any war where anybody gets shot at is not a small war in their own minds. And, and my hat's off to everybody who served in the Vietnam War. Uh, I actually have written about this. But the U.S. Merchant Marine in Vietnam plays an essential role. I mean, one of the things that you need to do is be able to transport and supply an army over 7,000 miles of ocean. And again, go to the USMM.org. They talk about the Vietnam War, have some great imagery, some great uh, uh, kind of visualizations on it, including a list of uh, casualties incurred during the Vietnam War. This list was done by uh, Dan Cashin. He's a rigger over at Acre Shipyard in Philadelphia. He sent me a copy of this, uh, so I'm always grateful for him for doing this. But he went in, and he's working on a project to really identify all the merchant mariners who died during the Vietnam War. And, and again, it's, it's an extensive list. Uh, many of them died on board the Badger State, which is a vessel that was lost en route to Vietnam when bombs broke loose 
on board, but some crews uh, died on board during rocket attacks. So for example, right here, uh, number one on the list, James Almany, he was on the uh, tug Michael, which came under rocket attack off of Vung Tau. And, and again, it, it's an extensive list. I think right now he has the total here. He's over, let's see, 169 that he's basically has. And he's, he's been working on this list for quite a while yet. So that list is, is, is pretty extensive. It's, it's much longer than the list that's here on uh, USMM.org. All of the, those numbers are included on here. Uh, I myself wrote a history on this for the US Navy. It's, it, it's a booklet that's available for download at the Naval History and Heritage Command free. You can download it, it's PDF. Uh, I'll have the link on here for you. And, and one of the things I talk about are the crews of those tugboats, the Alaska Barge and Transport. One of the things that the Navy found they needed in Vietnam was intra-theater transport, moving cargo among the ports of Vietnam. They had LSTs, which were crewed, believe it or not, by foreign nationals under un-American ships. Uh, that's a whole different story that I could talk about at a different time. But they also brought in the gr uh, crew from Alaska Barge and Transport, which had been working at supplying the Dew Line, the distant early warning line along the northern Alaskan Canadian coast. So here they bring in these guys from Alaska. They bring their tugs and barges. And now they're in the tropics working up and down the coast of Vietnam. And, and they were targets for rocket attacks. This is the Michael, as a matter of fact, right there, former Army tug. Uh, built in the United States under, under the um, uh, Maritime Commission. And uh, they suffered casualties, a lot of casualties, as a matter of fact. Uh, it, it's really a, a detrimental loss. And again, in the Vietnam War, we're talking about hundreds who were killed in this. And by the way, their names are not on the war memorial in, in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, they're not included on that, even though many, some of them died while transiting up the river to deliver military cargo. Some were victims of mine attacks with their vessels at anchor. Uh, seven mariners, for example, died on board the Baton Rouge victory when the ship was mined going up the Long Tau. So it, it's a pretty uh, um, uh, detrimental loss. And again, another example of that, many of the crews who sailed on these vessels sailed in the Jones Act trade. They sailed in the, in the coastal trade. The crews from Alaska Barge and Transport brought their Jones Act compliant tugs and barges across the Pacific to go sail up and down the coast of Vietnam to support the United States. And that really brings me to the end of my Memorial Day uh, talk for the Merchant Marine. Uh, I think that when we look at the Merchant Marine in perspective, we should honor the service of those Merchant Mariners who are out there risking their lives at times and have given the sacrifice in World War I, World War II, the Vietnam War. We've seen that happen. And again, in World War I, they really got no recognition whatsoever, although they did get a war <laughs> declared because they were on the front line, literally. World War II, it took until 1988 for merchant mariners to be declared veterans, by which point most of them had passed at that moment. Last year, the uh, American Merchant Marine Veterans Association, the AM AMMV, was able to get a congressional gold medal approved for those surviving merchant mariners from World War II who were still alive. Uh, I think that's a great uh, tribute to them. I'm looking forward to hopefully going up this September and talking at their annual convention. I was supposed to do it last year, but obviously that didn't happen because of COVID. And when organizations and entities attack the Merchant Marine, I think one of the things you, you have to ask is, is, do they know what they're talking about? You know, Cato loves to come out and attack the Merchant Marine. This is on the banner of, of their web, of their Twitter page. It's not the 1920s anymore. Time to end the Jones Act. Sounds great. You know, but there's a lot of things that were passed back in the 1920s and even older than that, that we still have around today. The, the Food and Drug Act, the Interstate Commerce Commission, the Constitution. So just because something's old doesn't mean we should get rid of it. They also should always take a moment to think about whether or not these people know what they're talking about when they use an image of a ship and it's not even an American ship. This is the German ship. Uh, this is a German ship that's being reflagged over to a British ship. This is the German Bismarck that's becoming the uh, RMS Berengaria right here. Excuse me, the Majestic. The Majestic. Uh, this is the vessel right here. This is the vessel right here. It's a colorized version of the image, but it's it. And the reason you can tell is because you can tell right here because there's the white star. There's the white star flag. This is the uh, RMS Berengaria. The three German ships at the end of World War II 
came in to the British and the American merchant marines. The Americans got the Leviathan, which went into U.S. lines. So this was a uh, actually a, uh, for the for the Leviathan, it was a stars with stripes on there, and then the uh, uh, Imperata, which went over to Canard line and has the Canard symbol in there, uh, became the the, the Berengaria. So, but this is majestic. So I, I mean they. they they get that wrong, which is fine. You know, no one else would notice that probably, but me. But again, it always makes me question if if, if you're going to sit there and, and and critique shipping, and be a critic of what shipping entails, you should at least know what ships you're talking about. Uh, finally, I'll always end uh, with with this. This is uh, the Maritime Administration's webpage. Uh, there's history on here. There's information on here. It's kind of clunky to get around. I'm not going to lie. So it's kind of hard to dig in there, but a lot of the resources I dig up come from here, including data and reports, which are always useful to have. So anyway, uh, on this mem past Memorial Day, I know I'm a day late and I apologize for being a day late on this, but I hope we all take a moment and reflect on those merchant mariners who gave their lives uh, in the service of their nation, particularly the ones that we highlighted here in this video from World War I, World War II, and the Vietnam War. This is Sal signing off. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe. Go ahead, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos when they come out. Also, give it a thumbs up uh, if you liked it. Feel free to share it with other people who enjoy it, especially those who have an interest in, in maritime history and the Merchant Marine. And until my next video, see you soon.